So thank you very much to for all organizers for this extraordinary conference. It's really uh, my pleasure to be part of it. I'm really honored. Um, thank you, Ellen, and thank you to my colleagues. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge as well my position as a white settler working in Zhangjiang in Montreal. So in, 19, in 2019, while I was busy preparing a grant application for my project on textile in modern and contemporary art, I searched the guild archives. The pandemic put a temporary end to this work. The archives were closed for several months and are currently being restructured. But thanks to Geneviève Duval, I had access to certain files. This paper focuses on the year prior to the First World War, a fairly short period in the long history of the Canadian and Duke Craft Guild. I argue that the focus on diverse cultures and authenticity as an exhibition and as a commercial strategy is not only specific to the founder's vision, but it plays a key role in the construction of a discourse that aims to assert their modernity and professionalism as cultural actors. A few years ago, I was visiting an exhibition with my students at a major Canadian museum. The purpose of the visit was to look at the collecting practices. For the occasion, I had asked a curator to join us. During the discussion, the role of the Canadian Handicraft Guild came up. I was surprised to hear our guests dismiss the relevance of the subject, stating that the Guild was just an association of amateurs. However, the Guild played a proven role in promoting the artistic work of many craft makers, mostly women. Besides exhibitions, the Guild organized educational activities, lectures, training, tours, competition, and awards. Cooperating affiliated associated institutions included the University of Western Ontario, San Francisco Xavier University, the University of Alberta, and the Art Association of Montreal, among others. In the wake of the arts and crafts movement, the founders of the Canadian Anti-Craft Guild promoted traditional arts. Their main objective was, quote, to encourage, revive, and develop anti-crafts throughout the dominion, end of quote. The Guild initially occupied spaces around, around Phillips Square in Montreal. In addition to administrative offices, the Guild operated a depot called our Handicraft Shop, which served as an exhibition space, a boutique, and a workshop. Phillips and Peck endowed the organization with a nonprofit charter funded by members' contributors, contributions and government grants. The Canadian Handicraft Guild established and developed a marketplace for the sale of items produced by artisans from many, from a variety of cultural backgrounds. The Guild built an important trade network that linked local producers to urban centers and international network. As Janice Ellen suggests, concerning many volunteers in the arts, this is a model that can be compared to that of a fair trade today. By 1914, 143 exhibits had been organized. During the 1910s, several branches were opened in Ottawa and Minton, Prince Edward Island, Vancouver, Calgary, Winnipeg, and Hamilton. During the summer months, branches were opened at Metis, North Atlee, and other summer resorts. The Guild sent craftworks all over Canada. Exhibitions were held in many different locations, including department stores, for example, the Bay and Ultra and Fruit in Montreal, and the Art Association of Montreal. Also, the Guild sent an exhibition to the Irish International Exhibition at Dublin in 1907, the Australian Exhibition of Women's Work in Melbourne in 1907, the Franco-British Exhibition in London in 1908, the Imperial Exhibition at the White City London in 1909, the Festival Empire in London in 1911, the Royal Albert Hall London, and twice at Wembley. These exhibits, juxtapose objects from a wide range of cultural background. Slippers, slippers embroidered by Duboko women, First Nations basketry, Limerick lace, etc. According to the founders, cultural diversity was a specific dimension of the Canadian market within the global arts and crafts movement. In an article written retrospectively published in the Canadian Geographical Journal, Alice Peck explained, quote, the work of the Guild is therefore more complicated than that of settled countries. The question of the language alone makes this evident. 
For the notice board, lately bore information in nine foreign languages besides English and French. Every officer, every member of the committee or the staff becomes willing to give long hours of overtime to advance the work because the belief that not only individuals are benefited, but that an art foundation is being laid for Canada, end of quote. Peck and Phillips promoted all traditional arts. They also tried to counteract the government's assimilation policies throughout the First Nation. Like Gerald McMaster, many scholars consider the guild to be an exception in an environment that favored the commodification of souvenirs. However, Phillips and Peck's philanthropy was frequently characterized by a paternalistic racial bias. Attempts to safeguard authentic and diverse cultural traditions were not free of romantic vision of other, exalting, for example, the influences of the Ancien Regime among French Canadians. Racist attitudes underlie comments about native and Inuit works while considering that, quote, the influence of civilization unfortunately tending to deteriorate rather than elevate their native taste and skills, end of quote. A certain paternalistic sense of caring also prevailed. As an example, the story about Michel Massy is constantly retold, quote, the lad, Michel Massy, is a native of Little, of little Miss uh, Mitis and was a victim five years ago of a railroad accident which left him a helpless cripple. Dreading lifelong inactivity and the burdening this family of this, with his support, he gladly took up the work of basket making, which he was taught by a member of the guild. He is now a skillful and intelligent craftsman, happy in his work, and is now self-supporting, end of quote. Therefore, their multicultural orientation must be understood in the prevailing colonial context. It supports a liberal, depoliticized vision of cultural difference, which negates structural inequity in favor of a dream reciprocity and authenticity, as it is clearly stated in the 1906 promotion of pamphlet. Mary Phillips' report from a Western trip on January 12, 1911 states, I feel that the Canadian Handicrafts Guild can be of great service in the country. This is a bond of union. In it lies one means of uniting in closer bonds of interest and sympathy, the many races living under different conditions throughout the length and breadth of this country, end of quote. Sorry, I forgot to do that. While there's no doubt that Peck and Phillips and their collaborators were participating in a colonial nation building project, they used to refer to Canada as a dominion. Their vision may also have been influenced by the socialist utopian ideas of William Morris. For him, craft societies seen as egalitarian societies were a place where workers were truly fulfilled through the creation of beauty. The Endicraft Guild emphasized this idea of self-accomplishment, quote, turning loneliness hours into joy and revenue, end of quote. In any case, in order to look beyond a simplistic narrative of oppression and resistance and to understand the way craft makers responded, much more research not needs to be done. How did cultural communities represent themselves in the workshops and tableau vivant, for example? How did the networks established through the Guild fuel social and artistic cohesion locally? For now, these question, questions remain open. In conclusion, the Guild's founders worked hard to create a market and a professional network for crafts. The success of such an important endeavor relies on symbolic capital. In the case of the Guild, multiculturalism played a key role in the construction of a discourse on authenticity as symbolic capital. As I tried to demonstrate, multiculturalism created a specific niche for the Canadian handicraft market. This strategic orientation relied on the possibility of establishing a wide network. Thanks to the sponsorship, sponsorship of the Canadian Pacific and Intercolonial Railways, the founders and some of their collaborator, uh, Christine Steen and Amelia Paget, for example, traveled extensively across Canada to meet artisans from different cultural backgrounds. 
In a Canadian society where women were still largely excluded from the processes of attaining professional status in the arts, and where the norms of acceptability most often force them into volunteer work, Peck, Phillips, and their close collaborators enjoy extraordinary mobility and professional networking, which provided autonomy, a sense of freedom, and self-regulation. As Sandra Alfoldi notes, quote, one of the key components, components agreed upon by all researchers in the field of professionalism is the privilege of self-regulation. As explored by Foucault and Larson, the ability to produce ideology is central to the status of a profession, end of quote. A multicultural orientation served not, served not only to construct a Canadian market in the global economy, but entailed the building of a whole professional network within which the women founders could enjoy privileged self-regulation and assert their own professionalism. Thank you for listening. <laughs>